Welcome to Inside the Studio. I'm Evan Sanford. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We've got a very special program for you. My guest is Congressman Pete Aguilar. He was elected in 2014 to represent California's 31st district, which includes the cities of Redlands and San Bernardino. He was the mayor of, of Redlands from 2010 to 2014, and he graduated from the university in 2001. It's an honor and a pleasure to welcome back Congressman Pete Aguilar back inside the studio. Thanks, Evan. Good to be with you. Always good to see you and uh, glad that we can uh, make this happen. Absolutely. So tell me how you've been doing during these difficult times. How's your family holding up? Uh, family's good. I'm here in Redlands. Uh, family is, is just like everybody else. We're observing all the, uh, all the uh, health requirements that we need to and we're staying close to home. Uh, kids are doing their schoolwork uh, from, from here from the kitchen table. So uh, we're, we're navigating life in the, in the new norm, but uh, just, you know, very thankful that, that uh, our family is uh, healthy and, and continue to encourage folks to observe all the social distancing and uh, that, is, that is necessary in order to, to move forward here. And like you said, you are joining us from your kitchen table in, 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 at your house in Redlands. Um, how is it working from home? What is that like as, a, as an official? Well, it's it's busier than ever. Um, I mean, honestly, we I've had you know conference calls um, with my colleagues in Congress. Um, you know, every day, uh, every work day, uh, we have conference calls. But in between that, I'm returning text messages and having calls with businesses in the region, um, listening to their concerns, talking with them about their struggles and, and experiences, uh, and helping them navigate some of the new programs that that Congress has created as well. When some of uh, the unease um, and unevenness of the uh, how those have been rolled out, so those are the concerns. Um, but we continue to do casework and, and work. If, if people call our office, uh, they're going to get someone. Um, we're going to we're going to you know guide them through the process, whether it's a local veteran with issues or someone who needs to help uh, guide through the federal agencies. So we're going to do our best to, to help them, even in, in real time, even from home. So let's start with some of the bigger headlines in the news. Some Democratic senators have proposed $2,000 a month payments until three months after the Department of Health and Human Services has declared the public health emergency to be over. That's sure to face some pushback in the GOP Senate and the White House. Do you support it? And what would you change? Well, I supported the, the CARES package, right? So, so CARES was passed on a bipartisan basis. Uh, we sent uh, checks directly to individuals um, uh, and families uh, that was necessary and needed. And I do think that there's going to have to be uh, additional uh, avenues for us to help everyday Americans who are navigating these uncertain times and these difficulties. Um, there's a bunch of competing proposals. Um, that's, that's one of them. Uh, another was, you know, built around supporting businesses, uh, paycheck guarantees, you know, those types of programs. Uh, that are passed through to business to keep people off of unemployment. Uh, those those make some policy sense now. With 33 million people filing for unemployment across this country, uh, we have to do more. Uh, we've got to do better. Uh, we've got to be faster. And if that means more direct contributions to folks, then we should be open to it. And if it means uh, helping businesses keep people on payrolls uh, directly, uh, then that needs to be something that, that, uh, that we look at and are focused on. Um, but we should, just like in the public health world, um, we need to be guided by uh, doctors and public health officials. Here, we should look to economists um, to, to help guide us through uh, what this looks like, with the only comparison being uh, uh, the, the depression as to how we move programs um, fast enough to help real people uh, across this country. Just today, I was seeing that Nancy Pelosi is saying that there could be some developments to a $3 trillion package on Friday. What can you tell us about that, and would you support any part of it? So we're, we're getting briefed on all of those you know, details now, but the plan is to vote on Friday. Um, so I'll be leaving here and, uh, and going back to vote a $3 trillion package. Um, what I can say is the, the biggest driver of that is nearly a trillion dollars for uh, our, our frontline workers, uh, state and local governments, tribal communities. You know, that is a significant help uh, and resource uh, right as they go into their budget season, which starts July 1st. They have to balance their budgets here in Redlands and San Bernardino and Fontana. Fontana reported 
um, uh, some, some record uh, shortfalls in, in revenue. Keeping in mind that our local cities derive basically two thirds of their revenue from property tax and sales tax. So when both of those have shortfalls, uh, you're going to see that translate to steep cuts in our communities unless we do something. And rather than shuttering libraries and, and you know, furloughing you know, police and firefighters, um, I think the federal government should step in and play a role to keep folks off of the unemployment rolls in our local communities, uh, just like we've done to the small business world. Uh, so that would translate to direct checks and contributions to every municipality in the country. I think that's something we're supporting. Just last week, the Riverside County Board of Supervisors voted to rescind some public health orders. Uh, what are your thoughts on various surrounding counties reversing those public health orders, making it more confusing for residents? Um, and and it, all of this is opposed to what's coming from the governor, which was a more unified approach. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I appreciate the question. San Bernardino County also uh, did something similar. And so what we've seen are, are our local counties uh, rescind those health orders. Um, and, and why I think that's significant is they need to be very, very clear with folks. We need to tell businesses, we need to tell residents to observe all the best practices we know, social distancing, avoid large gatherings, Wearing masks seems like the least invasive, least costly uh, thing that we can do as individuals. And so I think that we should absolutely still be doing that. Um, if San Bernardino County and Riverside County uh, won't require it, uh, we should take it upon ourselves as, as individuals and community members uh, to, to continue to exercise that. So that's what I wanna see is that consistency. And in order to move forward, um, and opening up uh, our economy in phases. Um, uh, you know, the White House CDC guidelines said we needed to see dr dramatic, you know, ramped down um, uh, positive tests, uh, as well as increased hospitalization capacity, uh, which we've seen here in, in our region, but we haven't seen the decline in cases. And so that's really what we need to see over a sustained period of a few weeks. We need to see declining number of positive tests, as well as access to personal protective equipment uh, for grocery workers and, and, and all those folks on the front lines, essential employees, in addition to robust contact tracing. Those are the pillars of what we're going to have to see in order to open up our economy even more. And we just aren't prepared and aren't ready and aren't there yet, honestly, locally. So I don't know if you've seen some of these board meetings, but they're, they've been pretty passionate with pleas from both sides of, of the issue. What are your messages to local health leaders, business owners, and residents? Well, I understand, I understand their passion, and, and I understand the need that some of these, and the frustration that some of these business owners have in, in not being able to, to open up their business. Um, but right now, our public health um, requires that we make these changes. And if we don't make these changes, um, that just like you've seen across the country, uh, number one, uh, Georgia did not get as many consumers and shoppers as they thought they would when they opened back up. The public won't believe you and they won't shop at these institutions if they think we're being cavalier about their, about their public health. And so we need to be mindful of that um, and follow the, the public health uh, directives and guidelines within the state and in our, and in our regions. Uh, and right now that says that we're not, we're not ready. And so I understand the frustration that people have and, and you know, we all want to return to, to the sense of normalcy, but if we are too cavalier about this and we move too quickly, um, just like Dr. Fauci testified today to the Senate, it will have repercussions uh, that are that are with us in the in the summer potentially or in the fall uh, if we go too fast. And so that's what we have to be mindful of is that uh, we're gonna we're gonna have these issues come up if we uh, try to snap back too fast. Now here in California, it's been three months since the governor ordered that stay-at-home order, and people are getting restless as we've just discussed. We're seeing protests in California, not just in the other states that have reopened in different phases. How do you feel when you see people out in the streets defying those, pro those uh, orders in public? I want people to observe uh, the best practices, and that means if they, uh, if they want to exercise uh, their, their opportunity to protest, they should do it in a way that doesn't put other people 
uh, in, in jeopardy. Uh, that means uh, you know, six feet across from each other, face masks, those types of things. So I think uh, the, the frustration is when people aren't observing those, they're putting other people at risk. Uh, and it may not be them or their family members, but it may be someone else's you know, family member uh, or someone uh, who's elderly in, their, in that household who has a pre-existing condition. Those are the things. But I do think that this gives an opportunity if people want to have their voices heard. I think there are innovative and new ways we can move forward with that. Uh, some cities around here have uh, drive up public comment where you literally just drive up your car and look into a camera and you're telling the city council your opinion, but you're doing it from your car while they are in city hall. So those types of things where we can use technology to convey people's viewpoint, make sure everybody's heard, but ultimately our elected officials are gonna have to follow the guidance of, of public health officials um, in order to, to keep this virus away and to keep us all safe. In your opinion, is testing the answer until we get widespread testing? Is that, a pl is, is that when you'd be in a place to feel more comfortable about reopening the state? It's, it's one critical piece is, is testing. And obviously the federal government didn't do enough here and there will be plenty of opportunity for us to uh, critique and analyze uh, who in the administration knew what, when, and, and, and why they didn't act on some of these things earlier. Um, but right now we still don't have uh, testing available for everyone who needs it, even though we're two months after the president you know, looked at the camera and told people that. So that's the frustration that people are feeling, but it's gonna be testing as well as isolation. Uh, people need to, to be able to isolate um, if they are exposed to someone uh, who had COVID-19, uh, as well as contact tracing. So that needs to be something that is done, uh, supported at the state level. Uh, the federal government right now still doesn't have a specific plan, a national plan for testing and tracing. We need to work, uh, the federal government needs to develop that and work with the states in order to implement it. But uh, all of the metrics show we need to do at least 1% of testing a week. Um, and so in California, uh, that would be, you know, four, be 4 million, uh, you know, tests uh, a week, and, and right now we're not doing anywhere near that. So we would significantly have to ramp up testing uh, every week, testing seniors who are at risk, testing asymptomatic individuals uh, as well who could be carriers. We need to have random testing. Lar people who work in large facilities, warehouses, they need to have a plan and a testing strategy. We need to see all of this in order for us to, to start building back those, those economic building blocks. Before we turn to your Redlands experience, which I'm excited to get to, what kind of projects were you working on before this happened? And is there any, are there any resources being devoted to those projects or is it 100% focused on this pandemic? Uh, it, it certainly is, you know, 90%, you know, focused on this, on this pandemic. And that is, you know, what our office is focused on and making sure people who need help uh, get help. Um, but like I said, at the, at the beginning, if, if people call our office, uh, they're going to continue to get the help and support they need. 909-890-4445 uh, is our office number. Uh, so we are helping uh, veterans uh, get access to uh, what they need and the medical appointments they need before uh, COVID-19. We're doing that and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, so there are, but most of the projects we're working on are driven by the committees that we serve on. And I serve on the Appropriations Committee, which has a large our jurisdiction and how we spend these tax dollars and how we spend these stimulus measures. And so that's what we've been uh, focused on and making sure that we do it the right way to help as many people as possible in the Inland Empire and across the country. In those initiatives that you just mentioned, was there anything not coronavirus related before this that you can tell us about that you were excited to be a part of? Uh, you know, the, the committee work really does, you know, kind of drive it all, but we've been focused on uh, some some housing programs that are helpful to the Inland Empire, um, making sure that a, an area as vast as, as the Inland Empire, um, that the metrics guide that. And, and what I mean is sometimes these federal programs are created and there are barriers and caps put on um, that lock out first time home buyers. And so we've been working um, for a number of years on changing those uh, metrics, changing those formulas to help more Inland Empire families uh, access uh, first-time homebuyer programs uh, and FHA loans. Uh, we don't. We, we we are outside of the LA metropolitan area, but that doesn't mean that we're rural. Um, but we we have we have a region and a county that is 
the same as Victorville and Barstow and has some elements that, that are, are different. And so uh, making sure that the San Bernardino Valley is taken care of with some of these formulas and metrics and guideposts set up by the federal government has, has always been something that's interest us to make sure my empire families have a, have a shot at accessing these programs. All right, well, we have a question from someone who's watching right now. California has a new master plan for aging. Do you know of anything that will be implemented to ensure older adults are connected to technology and support in order to take advantage of the changes in digital health opportunities and to combat isolation? Well, that's a good question. And uh, within, that, within that California uh, state aging group, there's a commission that actually helps guide some of these decisions uh, Cheryl Brown, our former assemblywoman from Rialto, serves on that as, as the governor's appointee. And so uh, she has been keeping me up to date. Uh, but you're right, there are a number of things that, that we need to be looking toward and we need to be mindful of is, is seniors who are experiencing this. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is a broader investment in broadband, uh, making sure that, that every home has access to the internet. Um, California is a very big and, and diverse state. Um, not all, not everyone here has that equal access and opportunity, uh, just like that's the case around the country. And so making sure that, that seniors have access to that, uh, just as, uh, as, as young people would with K through 12, um, as they are having to navigate uh, education from home, uh, we need to make sure that seniors have that ability to and that broadband at a reasonable rate. And the federal government can play a role in that. And so that's one of the proposals that's going to be in this package that was unveiled today that we're voting on later in the week. I was just thinking about this the other day and with all the school districts canceling the remainder of the school year uh, earlier this, this year, I was just wondering what the effect that, that will have on various school districts next year and how, and how the students have been impacted with the loss of the last two or three months depending on the district. Are you are you hearing anything that is addressing this and what could help with um, tele-education or anything like that to kind of have a summer school offered just for this year, a special version of it, just to bridge the gap so that they're not starting three months behind? Yeah, I would, I would look to our state leaders on, on that, um, but the governor has said in prior press conferences that uh, school districts might have to come back earlier. Um, so I, I think they've ruled out summer session uh, entirely in the state, but that uh, districts might need to look. Some districts start in September. They might need to look at coming back in August. Some start in August, and they might need to look to come back uh, earlier um, and to build in some of that flexibility just in case something happens in the fall, too. Uh, we need to be uh, nimble, and, and I think all the options should be on the table. Um, they might need to look at staggered start schedules, right? So not everybody will come to school at the, at the same time. Um, you might have to have staggered um, starting times as well as you might have to have some, some seating arrangements that are different. So uh, I'm going to leave that in the hands of the state superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, who's been to the Inland Empire quite a bit. Uh, he's been talking with the governor. And, and our local leaders are going to have to make those decisions. Uh, from our perspective, we just need to give them the support to do that to follow the guidelines, to implement the best health procedures they can, uh, to make sure that we're not laying off teachers during this time. Those are the things that are going to be important that we can help from the federal side. How did your time at the University of Redlands influence your decision to enter politics? Uh, you know, I guess I would point to um, a couple of professors who, who helped me along the way and, and really you know, believed in me when, when I didn't believe in myself. And, uh, you know, I came to the university uh, not knowing kind of what my path would be. And, and thankfully, the liberal arts education uh, kind of exposed me uh, to so many different, so many different classes and things. And, and so I came in almost as a, as a business focus. And I ended up taking so many government classes. Uh, Tracy Fitzsimmons and Barbara Morris um, were my advisors and, and professors at the time. And, and they said, you know, you're going to have to make a choice here. Uh, to double major or, or, or leave business aside because I just kept taking government classes because I enjoyed it. And, uh, and then Barbara recommended that I use the Tinker Scholarship to go to D.C. for a summer. And that's really what changed me was seeing folks um, uh, in Washington, D.C., seeing how they work and how they think and how 
how committed they were. And that's a, a one employer town in DC. Everybody either works for the federal government or tries to influence the federal government. And so uh, seeing how that world uh, existed and uh, made me come back and call on another um, University of Redlands alumnus, uh, Roger Salazar, to get my first job in politics working for the governor of California. So, you know, my, my, my arc and, and my career was basically uh, you know, kind of littered with uh, with folks, uh, me trading on other people's names, uh, other U of R alums, and and asking them for guidance and, and help along the way. And they, they treated me well, and that's my obligation moving forward. That's a perfect transition to my next question, which is, you supported Redland students uh, with positions in your campaign and offices. Uh, when the world wasn't on lockdown, you also met with them when they came to visit your office in DC uh, for May term. What, are, what have been some shining examples of students that you've come to know and work with? Uh, well, I, you know, I think so many, so many examples, but really, you know, benefiting from some of the interns that, that come to our local colleges and universities, you know, come from our region. Uh, we are blessed with, with some amazing interns and Congress changed our rules recently. And I was proud to be part of that where now we can pay interns um, a stipend to help them uh, realizing that not everybody comes from a background that allows them to uh, just like I didn't have a background that allowed me without help uh, to go to DC. So we need to do more of that. Uh, but I've been blessed with some amazing you know, Bulldog interns as well. I uh, was fortunate enough to hire a few of them uh, and, uh, and, and still have uh, some on staff and, and one on this call, uh, Parker, who uh, also went to UPEPA High like I did and went to U of R and has been a, a part of my team for, for a number of years. Um, so, you know, really just, you know, thankful to have uh, the, the benefit of the experiences of, of folks who have been kind of recent um, alums uh, as well. But, uh, you know, we share this, this common bond and want to help each other along the way. And that's, that's my obligation moving forward too, to, to young people, you know, across this region who, who just want a chance. Well, well, tell us about the transition from local politics to national politics and what made you want to do that? I loved my time in local government and there, there isn't you know, anything better than being the, the mayor of the town that you live in. Uh, you know, every nook and cranny in the, in the budget, you know, you know, every corner of the community um, and, and it never leaves you. When you go to Stater Brothers, it follows you. Um, you know, when you go to Home Depot, uh, it, the same thing. And so you know, those are the experiences that, that I'll remember um, and that I'll, I'll think fondly of. But, you know, realizing, you know, as a kid growing up in, in San Bernardino and Kaipa and then ending up in Redlands, uh, that there are a lot of people who need help and that the issues that I wanted to, to, to make an impact with on making sure that the Inland Empire has a, has a fighting chance and gets the resources that we need um, and making sure uh, that, uh, that we fix our broken immigration system and that people have access to health care. All of those things you just really can't do from the, from the city council dais. Um, and you can't do it alone. And you need help. And you need help of, of your federal office holders and officials. Um, and so I want to, to do that. I want to help uh, local cities and communities access those resources and, and really give our communities a, a fighting chance. The Inland Empire is amazing, but we are often overlooked in the shadow of L.A. And uh, we need to do we need to do more to bring attention to this region. But also, there's a lot that we have to do that we can control, which is making sure that people have access to vocational programs and, and education programs within our region. Um, and, and we do suffer from some of that. And so, making sure that we aren't just a region that's known for for warehousing, uh, we need to be a region that's known for innovation uh, and esri and thought leaders and and large employers um, who pay good you know, fair wages as well. You know, those are the things that the Inland Empire uh, needs, needs help and support with, and that's what I want to do. So just real quick, I have two more questions for you. What are some of the most important lessons you've learned since you began and uh, began serving in public office? Uh, you know, I, I think they're, they're just lessons that my parents taught me. You know, listen more than you speak, um, you know, is, is what that comes to mind. You know, making sure that, uh, you know, I don't know everything. And so that's why I rely on a lot of people to help me from my staff members in DC and, and San Bernardino um, to just, you know, people who I've come across in life who can help me and give me uh, guidance and experience and share their stories, business leaders, business owners throughout our region. Um, so, so just, you know, listening and really you know, 
Uh, my job title is my job description. Uh, it's representative. And so in order to do that effectively, I've got to listen to people. I've got to hear our community and I've got to be in the community. And, and so that's what I enjoy. And what advice do you have for young people that want to get involved in politics? Even in this day and age where everything is so partisan, what would you say to that person that wants to get involved? You know, don't, don't give up on us. Uh, don't give up on the idea that, that public service is important at all levels. And, and you know, being an elected official is one aspect of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I was a staffer for an elected official uh, working for your, your city or your county. Uh, you know, my brother's a probation officer. You know, there are a number of ways to serve your community and, and to help each other. And so I would just encourage people to be mindful of that. You know, um, you know, being public service minded, um, you know, the lessons that Tony Mueller, you know, teaches us at the, at the university um, uh, and someone who, who I love to death, you know, making sure that you put, uh, you know, service uh, above yourself and, and making sure that we all help each other. You know, those are the things I hope if people want to be elected officials, you know, that's great. Um, uh, and I'd love to, to help them and talk with them along the way, uh, whatever their political stripes are. Um, but just more importantly, making sure that people are, are public service minded is something that I really take personal and, and want to make sure that our young people are focused on. Everybody deserves an opportunity to be active in their community at whatever level. Well, I think we'll put it there and uh, just a perfect way to end the conversation. Thank you so much, Representative Pete Aguilar, the congressman from the 31st District of California. I really hope you and your family stay safe during these difficult times, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Until next time, I'm Evan Sanford, and this is Inside the Studio. Mm -hmm.